Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the final day of Learning Technologies Autumn Forum. How quickly two weeks have flown by. This is the first session today. It's Corporate Learning Uncovered, Exposing the Realities, Debunking the Hype and What to Do to Succeed into 2024. I'm Teresa Rose. I'm going to be your chair for the session. And your speakers today are Miles Runham, who is the Senior Analyst for Fosway, and uh, David Perring, who's the Chief Insights Officer at Fosway. And I know when we have uh, the face-to-face -face sessions for, uh, for for these two people and this and Fosway, way at, um, at learning technologies it's always standing room only you can't hardly get in the room so I can't wait to to see what David and Miles have, uh, have got to show us today and I know it's going to be another interactive session so without further ado I'll hand over to our speakers Miles and David welcome Good morning. Um, we've got so much to cover, as always, Miles, and I do feel embarrassed because um, we do try and cram a lot in. So we're going to fly through um, quite a lot of insight and try and also put you under the spotlight as well in terms of the questions. So I'm David Perring, director, um, was director of research at Fosway Group, now Chief Insights Officer, um, and Miles has joined us um, in the last, um, is it nine months now, Miles? And it's a pleasure to have him join our Six team months. as well. Six months. I'll tell you, it feels yeah, like six. Um, it, feels, it feels like nine, David, but it's only, it's only six, <laughs> six. But yeah, I joined Fosway as a lead analyst, taking responsibility for digital learning, handing over fr from from David to me. Uh, yeah, six months ago. Prior to that, I was running a, a learning sort of strategy, learning consulting business. Yeah. Um, but it's great to be uh, uh, in the conversation. Yeah, exactly. And from my point of view. Miles Junior has been one of the best things that's happened at Fosway for a very, 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 very long time. So there we go. So our agenda um, is really about trying to reflect on our, our, our digital learning realities um, research that we've done uh, through the start of the year um, and really just give you a little bit of a, a view into what's driving L&D priorities and activities and really get your reflections around it, what, what's driving yours as well. How ready are L&D functions for the year ahead and beyond? So what we've got in terms of their application, their focus, the sorts of tools that they're going through as well. And um, a broad question of, is technology coming to risk, rescue? Now, I've got to try, Mars got to try and keep me under control to make sure that this is a conversation and not a presentation, because um, we want to hear about your experiences. Um, I will not stop talking. So Mars is going to have to struggle to keep me under control. So my apologies, Miles. Um, I'm sure you're used to it by now. Okay, so I'll, just a little I'll bit of background. I, can, David, I would say, sorry, David, just just to check. Sorry, just as a one. Sorry to stop you immediately, um, but do yeah. uh, just to, to call out. Please do, folks, share your thoughts and questions and comments in the chat. We'll try and address them as we go, or, or catch them mm -hmm. uh, towards the end. But we're really, really interested to know how you see the world and, and how you sort of reflect on on the research and the evidence mm -hmm. that we're going to share. Apologies, David, for interrupting straight away, but just want to make sure that yeah, people no, are problem. happy to share if they'd like to. Yeah, you just jump in whenever. Um, but just to give a, a sense, we've done the, our survey since about 2014, 2015 was the first time we did it. We've been running this almost for, for 10 years. And what we've done is we always pick up on a, a, some consistent questions and then we try and pick out a few questions which are nuanced to what's happening in, in this particular time um, of the cycle, what, if, what evolutions are happening in our industry. Um, what we've done is um, usually we just give you one infographic. We've created five out of the long survey that people complete for us. Um, and what we've done is we've broken those down um, in terms of priorities, budgets and investment, learning technology maturity, skills and the future learning technology landscape. Those are the themes that we are going to try and go through and we'll see how far we get this morning. Um, just to give a little bit of background, basically we had about 400 respondents. Most of those respondents are from um, have a global responsibility. Most of them are from Europe. Um, there's about 85%, 87% who are European. Um, we asked people to say, give us that sort of sense of responsibility. If they're not global, then they also have a regional responsibility. They also have country-based responsibility. So there is a span of control, which is quite significant. The other thing to point out is that of the survey respondents, around half, right, and I'm, I'm trying to use that in the broadest sense, have more than five years experience in using learning, digital learning or learning technology. So this isn't necessarily just a, um, 
uh, a novice group. This is a group who've responded to us, who have a significant amount of expertise. And really about a, a quarter of those have been doing digital learning for more than 10 years, which is quite a, 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 a statement to make um, in a way, because that's quite a long time. So that's the little bit of background into the groups. And what we're going to do is, as I said, there's a supporting infographic, and we've released those on LinkedIn over the last um, four weeks, and they're freely downloadable from our website as well. Um, but we'll focus on the first one, which is L&D, priorities, strategy, and execution in an economic downturn. I think we've all probably felt some of the pain of that as well. So um, we have a question for you. And Mars, I'll let you do the interrogation. Yeah, so, so this, there's a few points in the session where we're going to explicitly ask you for your uh, your thoughts before either before and after we get into the evidence. So we we've got some some uh, um, some some of the data on uh, top priorities for learning functions or for learning professionals. So just great if if in in the chat, lovely to hear from you on your you know what what over the last twelve months has really been driving your priorities. What set the agenda? For your learning function that might be you know particular programs it may be in a particular uh, uh, policy or regulation it might be the skills agenda it could be compliance or whatever it is that um, you've seen uh, sort of dominating the, the, the your your function uh, your service and in your products over the last 12 months um, mm -hmm. so please do do chip those in in the chat we'll try and keep an eye on that um, I've seen there was a question from Scott about generative AI, which I'd like to, Scott, if we could come back to a little later, because I think we've got some some content on that. So, Louise, is sort of the skills agenda. AI, actually, having said, we'll come back to it. Here it is. Uh, ESG and skills, uh, shared vision and strategy, and measuring impact uh, and coaching to improve performance. So, it's an interesting range, David, of sort of technology, skills, I guess, strategy, impact, um, Scientific learning, perhaps you know, sort of reflecting the specifics of uh, Emma's organisation, uh, digital skills, core skills, uh, um, yeah, uh, and then sort of uh, 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 we've got we've got pretty much covering the ground of the of the, of the survey, David. Interesting leadership, compliance, uh, coaching, data. Skills is coming up, I guess, as a theme in terms of technical skills, digital skills, specialist skills. These are brilliant. Thank you, everybody. This is great. Um, so Dave, maybe, maybe, yeah, I, I, I'm going to struggle to keep up with the chat, David. Maybe if we want to, <laughs> we can compare. I'll keep an eye on the chat. Okay. We can compare that with 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 the the data. Uh, this is brilliant responses. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Yes, thank you. And, and just to give you a sense, right, so we, we asked that when we went through the survey, we created a list and we asked people effectively to say what was their top priority, what's their medium priority, what's their low priority, and what was not a priority. So you get the green as being the top priority, amber being the medium going down to red, which is not a priority. And um, surprise, surprise, and, and I'm sure there is an element of deja vu for most of us around um, the sense that compliance and regulatory training dominates quite a lot of activity, and that came out the top, and it's come out top consistently probably for the last years. And there's not necessarily a great deal of news in there, but maybe sometimes there's quite a lot of angst to, to the extent that actually haven't we moved beyond compliance regulatory training? I think the reality is that most organisations have significant regulatory frameworks that they have to operate in. And if they don't get those right, then they do feel a pain and penalty. But there's so much more to learn. And um, what came out in, in the survey really was this sense of career development, upskilling, reskilling, onboarding, reboarding, element of learning cultures so to, to trail away a little bit. But that sense of career and upskilling being the most of, some of the top strategic priorities, which add value in a way that maybe compliance training gives us a, a permission to operate as a business. And I think that's a really interesting um, trend um, within the data. Um, it's not necessarily been like that in the past. And what we found is that um, one of the challenges of that is when you ask people how much do you think your organization is an industry leader, right? So that you think you're the best in developing skills, um, investing in skills, in rewarding skills development and using people's or, or helping people plan their career based on skills, you're pretty much at a level of 50-50 as to whether the skills um, and your approach to skills is seen to be market leading around what is effectively from the previous slide the one of the top priorities or probably the top priority after compliance and i think that's an interesting sort of dilemma of what do we need to do to be better at moving away from 
being learning about knowledge, but learning and developing skills. Is there a difference in what we do and how we approach that? I'd like actually, okay. David, I think a bit uh, just, yeah, just sure. to folks, uh, I'd like to get you, your reflections on that point about skills has come up in the chat as not the only, but, yeah. but you know, consistent priority for people. But I think you're right. There's sort of this. This is a sort of about the organisation setting the agenda for learning to be successful in skills. I was wondering, yeah. you're interested to get people's views on that. Do you feel you have that kind of supportive yeah. and warm environment behind you to apply learning to the skills challenge? Or you know, or, 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 yeah. it'd be interesting to know if, if people recognise that in their own organisations. Yeah, because it's it, it, it's it's so moves beyond learning culture in a way. I think, Miles. I think it moves beyond learning culture because what it's talking about to some extent is the ability of us to align our learning agenda to the performance needs of the business as well. And I think that's something that's um, mm. super interesting. And overall, most and we've done the surveys probably about three years ago around skills as well. And one of the challenges that people found is actually trying to create space for people to develop skills is one of the tensions that they have to overcome. Um, and it's a real struggle. Okay, so um, I'll skip on because uh, we know we've got some questions coming up a little bit later to stimulate more conversation as well. But please put your your, your, your thoughts in the chat. But the, the other th interesting thing, and, and I'm sure this doesn't necessarily come out as a, a surprise for many, is that measuring impact and value add to business performance remains um, a, a, a major issue for L&D teams. When we ask people how advanced they are as a learning function in executing things like measuring impact, learning in the flow of work, automating and scaling their learning function, innovating learning approaches and mobilizing around strategic organizational priorities, we're better at mobilizing and innovating and automating our function. We see maybe quite we're, we're quite advanced around those than we are about measuring and reporting performance and value add. And that challenge is a systemic one that we hear both from um, suppliers who struggle to get vendor well, buyers to tell them what their outcome should be and what measures of success should be, uh, amongst other things. So that, that's something to sort of think about. Maybe if there's a development area for L and D overall, the thing about just getting started and planning is very positive around measuring impact. But there is an opportunity in a world that is swimming in data. To start to do that so much better so i think as well Miles, David, so I just, uh, that's, yeah. yeah i think well, well, was just, just to sort of share a reflection on that and do please yeah. people uh, keep keep your reflections yeah. coming uh, no, i think yeah. i think it's really interesting that that we've seen some progress i guess over the last few years mm. as we were mentioning in that sort of focus on strategic priorities yeah. the contribution of of, of learning yeah. in all its guises to strategic priorities i think what what makes me slightly less optimistic and enthusiastic is that you know that the data and evidence is the foundation of progress there and it's just yeah. continually this achilles heel in learning and development that sort of yeah. partly capability around data and that capability might be technology and tool set but also the confidence and the confidence to yeah. move beyond well this is my interpretation the confidence to move beyond learning data into performance data into you know commercial business data and to, you know to combine those data sources to tell that value story is yeah. it feels like you know we're still very slow to make progress there partly that's you know sort of suppliers looking for clues partly it's yeah. it's you know, customers looking for you know the, the key to unlock that value from suppliers as well but it, it feels there's a sort of bit of a tension there between the progress and the sort of that that anchor on on the vessel Definitely. as it were yeah. and one thing i'm really curious about is for, for those who are on the call now are there things that you've started to do that have helped you move that dial forward or advance what you're doing around measuring out impact or showing value. And if there are things, I think it'd be really nice if you could share that because it's um, only a small number to some extent who've got some of that expertise. And to trying to share that is mm -hmm. partly the reason for this session. So if you do have some thoughts um, about techniques or frameworks or approaches, some things that we've made recommendations around is trying to use a very old school approach in a way, like a balanced scorecard approach, where you start to break things down in the interactions with stakeholders around their reasons, their outcomes, their measures of success, which then you can start to, to track. Um, and uh, it, it's, but there must be other things that maybe you're doing. And maybe, I, I tend to think it's a lot about the quality of partnering and maybe this sense of uh, 
techniques and frameworks is actually all about the partnering. If you can partner well, then you will have a conversation with your stakeholders, which will evidence measuring impact and showing value rather than anything else. So, Mars, I'm not sure if, again, if, if there's anything that's come out in the chat. Um, yeah, there's a, well, I think there's a really interesting observation from Felicity White. So a lot of organizations are daunted yeah. by, by this. You know, it's sort of, it's so yeah. far from a traditional career progression and the mechanisms behind it. I think it's an, yeah. it's an interesting observation that it's sort of, you know, it does speak to sort of reinvention of the function a little bit, you know, which is yeah. easy to say and hard to, you know, hard to pull off. And, you know, there's a lot of inertia yeah, yeah. Uh, and a lot yeah. of, you know, sort of set expectations. So I think um, it, it's, it's really interesting. I think there's, there's some comments uh, from Tess. Hello, Tess. Uh, starting with a goal and clearly identifying the problem before you start. Yeah. Again, you know, sort of yeah. very sort of simple foundation. Uh, um, but uh, yeah. and as Teresa was was sharing with us earlier, that sense of you know knowing what uh, uh, what you're steering towards, what that looks like, and the kinds of evidence you'll need to gather to describe that is a really really important part of that foundation. Yeah, yeah, it's it's Fall super interesting. From, things... from Annabelle for for Kevin Yates as well as someone to uh, yeah. to turn to for that evidence based approach, which is yeah, a great yeah. recommendation. Yeah. Kevin's been doing this, but, for but a it's long interesting time. the crossover between skills and learning. Um, as we start to analyze the skills marketplaces and the skill solutions, many of those because they're closer to the conversation about. Um, strategic workforce resourcing are starting to put almost a number, a, a value behind the skills that an organization has based on the fact that if we had to hire people in for those skills, this is how much it would cost. And I think it's interesting, this sort of sense of as you start to network with other disciplines outside of learning, it becomes easier to find frameworks and re reference points which will help you measure the success and the outcomes but ultimately i think it, yeah, it comes down to engaging with stakeholders to think about evidence so maybe let's move on yeah okay so um the second area that we were focusing on was um corporate learning budgets um in our economic downturn um again miles a, a question for our audience to, to reflect on yeah so we interesting that that just to know from if if you have this available in your mind what have you, you know what over the last year or so has had the greatest impact for you on on securing or, or you know using effectively and efficiently your your budgets you know what's having that kind of impact um that allows you to have those the the, the kinds of conversations david was talking about with confidence you know is, mm -hmm. is this a partnership relationship is it a business case is it a particular program that's worked really well that you've been able to um to use as a, a, a you know a case study of success um, or you know, have you have you uh, um, tried different um, influencing approaches? So it'd be great as, as maybe if you can reflect on that, folks, as we go through um, the mm. next few few slides, because it'd be really interesting yeah. to get. I think what one of the things that, that that could be really helpful here is some of the ideas that have unlocked some mm. kind of value uh, for people alongside the data that'd be great so if you could share any of those thoughts as we go that'd be really helpful thank you okay. well, uh, while, while people are typing and thinking what i'll do is i'll quickly go through some of the um insights that we got from the survey um the key one probably was lnd budgets and this is the overall lnd function budgets felt the biggest pinch since we started the survey in 2016 so we prepared the survey 2015 released in 2016 with the, the results and we've never seen the number of um, people say that they were decreasing against the number increasingly. T typically, there's been about 8% um, of people who said that their budget's been decreasing year on year up until this point. Um, there is a big swathe of people that we haven't included, um, which were the people who said that it stayed the same. So we tried to use this chart a little bit as a swingometer, and it shows some element of inertia around overall L&D budgets. And that's probably the sort of key takeaway. People have found it tougher than they've had before, even during, than during the pandemic. Um, what we did think is cross-correlate cross some of the questions about um, C-suite support and how what the impact that had on people's budgets. And what we found was if you've got C-suite support, you're twice as likely to have seen your um, budget grow overall than if you didn't. So influencing your sweet suite is a really critical strategy for L&D functions, not to be passive, to be actually very um, vocal and proactive. And maybe that's why the measuring results and talking about evidence of outcomes is really important. In the same breath, as we co correlated between the CC support or perceived CC support and investment in new digital learning projects, 
we found you're three times likely to have accelerated your investment in new digital learning projects, um, be that aligned to particular initiatives, probably around the priorities, than if you didn't. So C-suite support, and, and it sounds trite to say it, but it, and obvious to say it, but it really does matter, and at a scale of threefold. But those changes um, uh, that for those people who did have budgets, even if they've um, seen them decrease, the trend is to invest that learning budget increasingly in digital learning. Um, the only area that saw um, people say, I'm going to decrease really um, their budget from a digital learning point of view was outsourcing the digital learning team. Um, you can see the sort of swingometer, but if it's about actually in investing in my internal team, if it's about investing in learning services, investing in platforms and content, the emphasis has been to increase my spend in those areas. So even though overall people's L and D budgets have felt a pinch, actually that has been focused into digital learning to help things scale. And content seems to be the, the queen at the moment or the, the king, depending on what you want to look at it, in terms of being the focus and platforms as people try to re-energize their approach around how their platforms. Do you work. think, David, sorry, can I just ask you a supplementary question on yeah. that, the, the previous slide? Do you, do you think that that yeah, sure. sort of swing towards, towards content reflects that budgetary pressure as well, that there's a hint of sort of cost saving, I, I, don't, I think it's always a bit of an overgeneralization to say that, you know, the creation and management of content is cheaper or lower cost. But yeah. part of that, the, the reason shift is that sort of, you know, substitution. I think it's about higher yeah. cost to lower cost. Yeah, I, I think it's about scalability and cost. So we know digital learning, it, the, the mantra of it even 20 years ago was it can deliver learning faster and to the same level of um, outcome. If it's about information exchange, for example, and there's loads of information about that that goes back 20 years that shows that's the case. So I think it just shows a, almost a relentless shift to using um, more content approaches. What's interesting is maybe in the next slide, if I can go on to that, because I think it shows some interesting bits, is when people are thinking about how they resource L&D projects for the year ahead, the growth areas are about trying to use internal resources. And that's what really those bottom three charts show or three bars show. Um, using internal talent marketplace is really about saying, who else can I use within my organization to help me on my learning project? Upskilling subject matter experts and project teams to be more self-sufficient. Redeploying existing learning team members to be involved in maybe doing a bit things a bit more digitally. And I think that all speaks to the, the ongoing mantra of, I need to do more with less. And how can I do that? And technology inevitably has, plays a part in that. It also, David, I think it, it sort of talks, yeah. you, you know, you mentioned earlier on the partnering relationships and it's come up a little bit yeah. in, in, in the chat as well, that, that, yeah. uh, uh, that, you know, those three, those three bottom bars kind of, or at least at, Two of them, perhaps the yeah. two, the two uh, rely yeah. on those kind of relationships and partnering. That you know, that, that those senior yeah. stakeholder relationships, obviously, foundationally important, uh, um, but also those yeah. kind of more operational and collaborative partnerships in the organisation, equally important as this shift happens. You know, to sort to, to rely on internal resources, you have to line up yeah, teams so. and experts in the organisation. You have to, you know, tool go get your toolkit ready to support them, etc. Um, it's different yeah, relationships definitely. that are more important parts for delivery as well. Yeah. But I think there's something maybe, and, and I didn't want to be the first person to mention AI, but I'm sure we come on to it. Um, is about you haven't been, the there's plenty of it. There's plenty of it in the chat already. So. <laughs> Good. <laughs> but there, there is, there is a, always a focus on trying to democratize self-learning, if that makes sense. And that's not just individual enablement, but actually enable people and teams and groups and projects to be self-sustaining around how they educate people about changes etc and i think this speaks to that and um i know we've been here before potentially but actually maybe there's tools which make it easier for us to upscale our internal experts though in ways that we've not done before okay so there was a a few reflection questions um that we've had again I th whether we want to 
if you want to go through these miles and, well, there's a, and there's, reflect on there's, well there's a few actually there's a few ref chat. there's a few reflections that have come in so, so from lisa yeah. was, was talking about the use of yeah. kind of kpis and dashboard reporting yeah. uh, including return on investment or commercial contribution i guess um mm. uh, uh which is an interesting kind of foundation that kind of constant rhythm of communication to senior stakeholders about what you're doing yeah. how it's working etc yeah. and teresa's joined us to share some observations as well so uh, yeah. uh, you've had a, probably a keener eye on things than i have teresa so go ahead yeah. yeah, there's there's some questions uh, that have come in as well that we could probably start to look at because um, they've got a lot of votes. Yeah. So let's uh, mm -hmm. let's have oh, a look okay. at this one from from Rohit. So measuring is crucial, but do we have a clear understanding of what should be measured, the appropriate appropriate methods for measurement, and perhaps most significantly, when to measure? And this is the big question: How long does it typically take to recognise noticeable changes? Good question. Who wants to take that? <laughs> <laughs> I guess I, I guess one one point that, that, that I think it's useful to make, and this perhaps connects to that KPI point, is that it's really helpful to have a kind of constant monitoring of a number of metrics as you go, so that you're not relying on kind of before, during, and after for specific uh, uh, programs and activities. So I think if you've got a good sort of product dashboard sets and KPIs, mm -hmm. uh, um, that that's really helpful to start to understand and manage expectations of the impact you're expecting to see. I guess the kinds of measures that are appropriate slightly depends on, on what you're trying to achieve. Mm -hmm. I think my, my uh, uh, I suppose my view and from, from my own work, you know, with clients and also, you know, in my own activities on, on the client side has been to try to uh, gather and have as much sort of sensitivity around the, the non-learning measures as well as the learning mm -hmm. data um, that starts to describe that impact that might be in people data it might be you know the survey data it might be commercial data but I think sort of having those data sets to hand um, is, is really important I don't know David if you want to add anything there about you know sort of the timing and um, the timing and the kind of cadence oh, of measurement yeah my, my personal view is you need to measure go by the measures that are important to your stakeholders and that's what why that partnering is so important um if you base yourselves in their shoes around what things really matter to them what keep them up at night what kpis measures of success when we whatever you want to call them are critical to their communication to their stakeholders their leadership team then you will inevitably start to zero in on the evidence that really matters and so the cadence then becomes, so what's the cadence of reporting for those KPIs for your stakeholder? And what sort of trajectory do you think people should be having in terms of their success? So um, you almost need to start from day one and just keep measuring and see if there is an out outcome, there's an impact on what you're doing as a learning function around that initiative or that team or that group based, I would say, primarily on your stakeholders outcome measures, be that average call handling time, be that fault rates, be that um, employee engagement, whatever it happens to be, you have to focus on those and the cadence that they're there, therefore measuring. If you're not seeing any change after maybe 30 days, then you may want to start to have conversations about are we doing the right thing? Because you should be used to able to see some pretty rapid results in certain situations. Um, probably after 30, 60, 90 days is probably not bad cadence because it's not just about measuring outcomes to show that you've made a difference it's also about measuring outcomes to understand whether what you're doing is right as well so i think there is a, a sense of don't be afraid of the data it informs decisions um, and the more you talk about the outcomes for stakeholders the better and, and i love the quick, quick, uh, the item from kerry about stakeholder management you do need to have a stakeholder management plan you need to know who your stakeholders are you know to know how positive or negatively feel about you even if they know who you are and you need to be thinking what is our strategy to move their thoughts about us forward in a very positive way so those are maybe answering two questions in one go but uh, that's my thinking right and it's tough yet you have to get spend a lot more time investing in those conversations with your stakeholders and actually put your neck on the line a little bit to say well we're going to try and sort this out for you if it doesn't work then it doesn't mean you failed. You've just got to try something else, right? And that's maybe thinking in an agile way as well. Don't have to do it all. Yeah, I think. 
I think it's a really good point. I think you have to, I suppose one of the things that can be difficult, particularly in smaller teams, is you need to dedicate, yeah. somehow dedicate time and resource to always measuring as well. It's not something you just do yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, around a program, yeah. uh, you know, you, although you need to do it around those things. It's just, you have that sense that it's, it becomes a regular part of what the team and the function does. Maybe it is someone's yeah. role or part of someone's role, but it's a, const it's a constant um, activity and priority, not a kind of nice to have or add on. I think it's really important to sort of yeah. build that habit um, or build that function yeah. depending on how much resource you have. Mm. But ultimately, that most of the key, critical um, reference points, most of those critical data points aren't yours. They belong to the business. And um, you just need to be able to prove maybe uh, the efficiency of what you're doing, maybe reflect, but the effectiveness is ultimately in what people do, not what they know. Okay. We've got another so, question um, as well, unless we want to save that yeah. one till a bit later, because that's an AI question. So do we want to hold that one until a bit later? I think so. We, we'll, we'll try and rush through the next little bits and then we'll okay. maybe rally around that as we get a bit closer to the end. But we'll definitely leave uh, 10 minutes at the end for, for more questions. So um, let's have a, a move on. Um, so the next section and we've got uh, the, the, all these infographics is just a little snippet of it really um, just to give you a sense of what's there and um, we've got more data behind this which we'll try and find ways of sharing probably over the next year or so um but this is all about learning technology maturity um effectively in digital era right it's difficult not to be close to something that is um digital in some form or another in our very um spoiled lives so um what i'm going to do is just give you a sense of when we ask people very simple questions about, do you think your current learning platforms are fit for the modern workforce? Um, this hasn't moved from last year or the year before very much. Um, pretty much half say no. Our learning platforms are not fit for the modern workforce. And that may be uh, an, a change in expectations. It does make you wonder why people bought these things. Um, typically, people are signing up for learning platforms on a three to five year cycle. So there is some hope that even if you're trapped at the moment in this sense of having a platform that's not fit for your employees, that maybe that is something that can change. Um, through referencing people who said that they did have a platform that was fit for modern workforce against those people who said whether they were using an HR platform, a talent platform, a learning platform, people who you best of breed, almost pure play learning platforms are twice as likely to say that their solution is fit for modern workforce. So there is a bias to those sorts of solutions. If you've got a learning platform which is dedicated, you tend to get something that is better for your workforce. Uh, that's what we're told. The other thing is just that most when we look at the spread of expertise around using different elements, and hopefully this comes out okay on, on your screen, most L&D teams have a basic approach to performance, development planning, skills, and career development and adaptive learning. So if you look at these lines, the blue line says we're doing something that's basic, and all the things that are maybe the more interesting stuff to me, <laughs> learned career development, um, development planning, skills, and capability, they're basic. When you ask what people that do as intermediate, um, there's a sort of splay towards um, the more left-hand side of things around blended learning, certification. Um, and then when you go for the things that we're advanced around, there's very few, with the exception of um, structured learning programs where people feel confident uh, or maybe feel they're more advanced. So if you think about the challenges that organizations had that we specified at the start, which was compliance, well, that feels like a structured learning program, but then we've talked about upskilling, reskilling, then there's a few gaps in our expertise and development that needs to happen in order to close that. Um, and something maybe we need to focus on, maybe that's a cultural thing within our learning team, maybe it's a, uh, a lack of expectation from our stakeholders in the past as well. So there's something to watch out for, um, something to sort of be aware of. Um, and just to, again, just to take a moment to sort of take your reflections, again, this maybe Teresa, we can come back and, and think about the, this one. What does a fit for the modern workforce learning product look like? Does anybody have ins any inspiration, things that they've used to assess learning platforms most recently? And how do we need to improve learning experiences so that they work more effectively for skills in particular, skills development? So maybe Teresa, we can sort of reflect a little bit on the, the chat 
and also see if we can stimulate our audience to think about what does it take to be um, really, what does a modern workforce suitable platform look like and how do we need to improve our learning experiences? So um, let's have a, a see and see what comes back. Ooh. Looks like we might have lost Miles, so I'm sure he's trying to reconnect. Yeah, we've lost we've lost Miles. I'm sure he's. I hope yeah, his broadband's sure. not. Oh, back. Uh, oh, excellent. Ah. Welcome Sorry back. We did make you panic a bit there. <laughs> I, I lost my connection. Apologies. Um, I don't know what I've missed, but I'll join in as I can. Yeah. So we were just asking the question about what does a fit for modern workforce learning product look like? and um, what do we need to do to improve our learning experiences and uh, see if that stimulates some people to share what they're doing um, as, uh, as L and D pros. Okay, yeah, we're yeah I, I to suppose get, just... Get so. oh. yeah. Sorry, go on Miles, okay. go Miles. Great. No, I was just, I suppose this is slightly having loaded the question in this way. I think one of the concerns that, that I've had in working with uh, um, working with, with customers and clients over a number of years is, is that there can be a dangerous focus on what the product looks like rather than what mm. it does. And I think that focus on interface, yeah. that kind of having the modern interface, you know, and that we've had the metaphors of, you know, Instagram mm. for learning, Netflix for learning, TikTok for learning, et cetera. I think the behavior of the interface is not the same as, uh, and and not the same value as the functionality of the product and i think a lot of that's to do with you know the use cases are supported but also the data that informs those so that sense of personal relevance mm -hmm. um you know and the fact that user control uh, and user choice are probably some reflecting points um that i i hope i haven't mm -hmm. duplicated anything you said whilst i was offline as well no you're perfect spot on no but i love what people are putting in here um scott thinking about mobile friendly bite-sized not just tick box, um, not glorified PowerPoint. I think we, we all probably feel that. And I think some of the interesting things that we've heard from organizations that are trying to mature their approach to digital learning is a focus on more scenario-based approaches. So thinking about how do I create environments where people can purposefully practice? And they're also thinking about how they create additional areas of personalization so adaptive learning thinking about how can i make sure that miles and david and teresa just get what they need not the full hour and i think that's one of the things when we talk about sort of the impact of ai on commoditizing e-learning actually that may be one of the um breaks in the cloud uh, if, it, if i can put it like that it's one of the sort of rays of light that says actually we can do things better um, if we yeah. can maybe harness some of the AI to support some of that, because it's, it's about processing, it's about personalization at the end of the day. I think there's there's some sort of uh, um, expressed frustration. I'll try and paraphrase this in the right way yeah. with, with existing learning platforms. So a call for yeah. if anybody, you know, anybody, would they wholeheartedly recommend theirs? If so, which one? Uh, um, I think there's a lot of, sort of support for that sentiment. I think Tess yeah. mentioned earlier the fact that there's that sense mm. that, that perhaps this is more about the HCM systems rather than the best of breed, that they're kind of yeah. given to us and you kind of have to yeah. get on with it. So I think there's that sense of perhaps alongside that um uh, the need for kind of user control and user choice is that sense of you know mm. for the for the teams as well is this something that i feel i can control and i can mm. manage on behalf yeah. of my audiences it, then maybe there's there's a kind of bit of frustration perhaps in in the background yeah. there um which i think is, a, is an important consideration is how well you can control you know yeah. your product set on behalf of what you know about your audience yeah. Yeah. And I love what Felicity said about that being contextual scenarios, that sense of actually really putting yourself in the shoes of your learners and as, as workers, the things that they find tough, the things that they struggle with, the things that would make them maybe sleep better at night, the skills that they need and the environment to practice and rehearse so they can be at their best. Um, I always think that's one of the, the key points. And that's what Lisa's put here too, that sense of holistic learning, personal development, performance, career. Um, I love that sense. And I think there's then if, if you break it into those sections, you can start to think about ways that we can support learning through feed, peer to peer feedback. You can think about that just in time support. You can think about the coaching, the reflection um, as well, let alone the future career direction. So love that. Cool. So yeah, I, I think, we said we try I, I think it's, it's, uh, sorry, go on, go on, David, go ahead. No, go on. You, you go and then we'll 
scurry on through the next ones very quickly. I just, I suppose, I, I, was, I was encouraged in, in the conversation in the chat, and I think the sort of the, and, and yeah. perhaps we'll, we'll pick this up again. Uh, um, and what you were saying, David, as well, is that sort of the 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 moving beyond the the distribution of content. You know, content is yeah. part of the answer, but it's not it's not the solution yeah. in the sense of you know engagement, interactivity, practice, rehearse, mm -hmm. feedback, coaching, yeah. peer connection, all of those things yeah. that you know for me to do something not just to use, yeah. you know, kind of use and consume something, which I think is feels like a, yeah. a vital and much more important than those considerations of kind of interface and presentation as well. And, and relying on data again, as we were talking about before. And data is the key to personalization, right? The more you know about someone, the, the more you can target exactly what they want. So um, we'll move on because I'm, I'm conscious we've got quite a few more things to try and cover with you. Um, uh, and what we want to do is just, I think we skipped the one around skills, to be honest, because um, we are a bit constrained on time. Um, maybe that's something for another day. Um, but the, the sense of the shifting, turning technology landscape, how, what, where are people pointing themselves and what are they looking to pursue in the year ahead? I think it's something that we can um, just explore a little bit in terms of what people's thoughts are. So again, Miles, from uh, the audience view, yeah, because I, mean, I think we've probably seen some hints of this with people's sort of yeah. observations about what they think, uh, um, uh, you know, that modern, uh, um, you know, uh, technology experience should be. Uh, but this would be, I suppose, to build on that, if, you know, what it, what is it that people are looking at over the next couple of years? And it may be that, you know, investment might be too blunt a term. That's true. I think Miles has got a... Uh, uh some challenges with this connection again. So um, what we'd really want to do is just get a sense from your perspective is, where do you think digital learning investment is gonna be focused over the next couple of years? So what are you going big on, um, if I can use that phrase? Where are you looking to invest? What sort of technologies are you looking to explore or examine? So um, it'd be really nice to just get your sense in, in the chat or your back miles. So, so I was trying to fill in. Yeah, so I'm struggling. Virgin Media is not helping me this morning. Apologies. <laughs> Apologies. Um, so, but if there's is anything that you think you're going to be invested in, and again, just type into the chat area areas that you're thinking about exploring for the year ahead. Maybe that is the big AI question. Not sure, but just to give you a sense, though, so we ask people where do you expect your demand in digital learning platforms to change in for the future, and the areas that people said they were going to use more was analytics and that's really quite interesting because it does come down to that sense of analyzing the sense of what impact are we having but also what's the effectiveness and efficiency what is working what are people skipping through so really getting you probably think of that as being an almost intelligence that we have about our inputs and out outcomes um a shift to more skills management and that's a really exciting space from an hr point of view we're seeing organizations think very seriously about how they ad ad adapt or adopt a more skills-based um, organization in terms of how they divvy out work, how they structure, invest, and create career paths. That sense of collaborative learning, career development, and content authoring. Those were the top five that people said they were going to expect to use more and demand more in the future. But there's some real interesting bits in there about what really works and how whether learning from a skills point of view can stand alone with skills. Um, invariably, it needs to be more integrated across the full employee life cycle. So that's a, a key area. Um, and, and as I said, that sort of ray of light in amongst the clouds of those for half of people who say, actually, our solutions aren't fit for the modern workforce between 40 to 45% expect to change their solution within two years. Now, whether they will change their solution is different kettle of fish, but the things that they're looking to do is skills management, content authoring, analytics, career development, and LMS even features in there in terms of, well, there's about 20% within 12 months, and there's, well, as I said, with about 40% within two years. So we can probably reset expectations. If we have a clear view, of what we want to achieve. So I'll take a bit of a brief pause there. I, again, I don't know if there's anything that came out in the chat, Miles, as we were going through the um, future expectations. I, I saw there's things about social learning, skills-based, yeah, learning. And 
skills i think there's a few mentions of ai i think which you know people are are, are hoping to get yeah. if they can depending on their environment yeah. uh, and, and time available i think it's just interesting i think the, the point seems to be that that or at one point is that you've got yeah. the, you know lms is, is is kind of almost it's always there yeah. but what people are focusing on now is is what else you know whether that's part yeah, of the yeah, lms yeah. functionality or it becomes you know another yeah. platform or it becomes a tool set in and around your, yeah. you know your, your lms and building out an ecosystem it's you know there's the, yeah. the and in the chat i think i don't want to sort of uh, uh, you know simplify it yeah. but there's a recognition that yeah. so much of those uh, so many of those applications are being considered now it's a sort of what else yeah, yeah, the yeah, managing yeah. Of, of of the assignment and delivery it yeah. is, is 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 one part but but those additional more kind of uh interactive and personal components uh and the more practical um sense of experience yeah. is, is really important as well yeah and, uh, and we are moving uh, on to ai as well inevitably yes that's true chat. that's true yeah but and, it, and i think it's super interesting right because I, I think when we look at what people are doing quite often what's happening is people are thinking about other touch points and there was a time when all the road, the only way to get to learning to some extent was through the learning system. Increasingly, how you surface that learning system into other, I call them workflows, but other touch points. Um, and those touch points can be the workflow. Those touch points can be the skills platform um, that's helped me understand my mismatch or match to particular roles. It can be the surfacing of those learning opportunities, be that assignments or be that workplace or be that just in time support in the context of the individual. Um, so sometimes we're seeing those appear in career development platforms, seeing them appear in internal mobility solutions. So probably looking beyond the learning platform, I think is one of the most interesting things. And it's difficult to find many of the providers who aren't looking about how they can surface their learning into Microsoft Teams. So whether that actually yeah. solves the learning engagement problem, I'm still not sure. I think there are some challenges around how we really make learning a bit more human and use the yeah. nudges to create better connections. I think the risk is that that Teams or Slack or other you know other tools yeah. become uh, another distribution channel for content rather yeah. than a place of you know of sort of uh, uh, of activity interaction and you know yeah. sort of that human yeah. experience. So it's really important. Yeah. There was a point as well, David. Just whilst you were talking, Scott shared and a couple of thumbs up on yeah. this point about yeah. uh, integration ecosystem APIs uh, yeah. and the fact that APIs are the availability of an API is not the same as having an yeah. API that works and is implemented. Yeah. And, uh, you know, he mentions yeah. that they can be expensive to implement. I think it's a really, really good point that that yeah. lack yeah. of, or the challenge yeah. of standardization of yeah. interoperability of tool sets, particularly interoperability yeah. of data sets, yeah. is a really, really yeah. important challenge in lots of organizations. And having an API yeah. in your documentation is not the same as implementing yeah. that API in reality. It's a yeah, really good point. True. I don't know if you want to very add anything on. I know that we've we've yeah. we've rode this hobby horse a little bit ourselves. Yeah, that's point. true. Yeah, but, but, it's, but it is a super important point. And, but I think that some of the underlying things that are happening in IT is the emergence of what's called a Mac arch architecture. So M-A-C-H, and just in the moment of pressure now, I'll try to remember them, but I'll probably forget. But it's um, modular, API, um, cloud, and headless. I can't, I'm amazed I remembered all that. But basically, headless means it appears anywhere. Um, cloud is it's in the cloud. I think we've used to that. Um, API first is because you need to connect it to different um, environments and modular is because actually it's little modules in context which start to change things and what's interesting is in other parts of IT they're going down that route maybe learning's just being a little bit slower to catch up and do that in a mature way but I think the the pressure's coming from other solutions to push that along so super interesting do check out Mac architectures if you're into into the tech okay. Okay. Pop that in the chat. so and we're down to our last uh, 10 minutes um, so what's next? Um, we, we, we've done a, a short sort of survey around AI in learning. We'll try and get that out to you for December. It just covers um, some of the basic sense of where we are in that journey. Um, and, and just to give you a little bit of a sneak preview, and Mars, I'm not sure if you want to talk through this because I know this is something that you've been digging into a hell of a lot over the last six months um, around AI, but this sense of 
what's impacting LED functions today and where do people see it going tomorrow? Yeah, and we've had there's a question in from, from Paul as well, actually, about the danger of AI mm. used to generate yet more dubious yeah. quality learning content faster rather than addition key priorities, yeah. etc. So I think yeah. I think it will maybe we'll we'll talk through that as well, uh, Paul, as we yeah. look at this. I think I think I suppose my I, I it's interesting when this data started to emerge, we saw this sort of interesting sort of uh, um sense of experimentation curiosity people are you know using ai in various ways in their uh, somewhat you know a moderate amount is that, that that sort of you know lovely normal distribution curve on the left about what's being applied now um but there's this expectation you know that in 12 months that uh, things are going to change a lot and so you know there's that mm -hmm. portion of about 38 percent saying uh, expecting a great deal of change a great deal of impact in 12 mm -hmm. months. I think it's really, it's really interesting about that. And I, this might be partly to do with the kind of the frothy nature of conversation. And particularly, you know, LinkedIn is an amazing experience at the yeah. moment in terms of conversation about AI. But I, I think expectations perhaps of the, of the extent of that impact are probably set too high too soon. Hmm. So I think there's a lot to um, to unpack and unravel, and we've had some of that in the conversation about you know data hmm. uh, availability, uh, uh, data cleanliness and readiness, uh, you know policy considerations, maybe regulatory considerations in certain hmm. organisations and industries. And I think back to Paul's point, hmm. I think that that this anticipation of a great deal of impact in a short space of time. It's probably, uh, and, and we've seen this in other data sets as well, is probably to do with the focus on content. So uh, the yeah. generative AI has been this sort of explosion of opportunity around the, the production and creation of media assets and then the authoring of those into you know, digital learning. There's a great deal of opportunity for efficiency, uh, as I think Paul was describing, maybe. Um, and I, so I think that feels very close to home. Uh, you know, whether that's a great deal of impact mm -hmm. or just a great deal of efficiency, I think is, is a really important yeah. question. And I think I think there's a real, you know, that, that it's an in, we're at an interesting point in, in a digital learning industry that has been so wrapped up with the creation and distribution of content. We've yeah. seen this powerful new means of making that content much more cheaply yeah. and much more quickly become available all of a sudden mm. and what the impact of that will be i think is, is what we're going to start to see over over this sort of 12 maybe 12 to 24 month period um mm. i think the the temptation for efficiency is going to be very very powerful because the cost savings are great you know mm. this isn't just saving of shaving off you know five to fifteen percent this could be a fundamental mm. change in the economics <clears throat> that fundamental change is going to have will have an impact mm. I, I think you know perhaps not the one that we were anticipating but I, th I think it will you know will have an impact my guess is 12 months is a bit too far too soon but i'd love to know what what mm. what people think um uh, you know about that in the chat and also david you know your reflections it's come up you know, in, in a lot of Fosway work in different guises over the last six months or so, and I'm sure in everyone's work as well. And, 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 and I'm, just to remember to some extent that I think one of the key things you need to do as a learning professional is look beyond its impact on directly on learning. It will start to appear in other places. And I think we're gonna see some expectations change um, and those will start to evolve very rapidly. Um, Microsoft are releasing their Copilot, I believe, on the 1st of November. I think that will start to set expectations about how other systems and other solutions work and start to trickle in. So if you're not uh, um, following people's reaction to Copilot over the follow into December, then you're probably missing a trick. So that will be, a, I think, a, a, an immediate tell. Other areas to think about is, for example, in skills, there's been a lot of advance um, when work that's been done in the skills sector from resourcing um, to help understand what skills people have by reading their um, skills expertise from their CVs. People are starting to switch the AI to scan the sorts of documents they create and the work they're doing, the way they handle particular calls. All these things are starting to emerge and they've been in place for more than a year in many organizations. So there's probably touch points already that um, are, I think, hugely going to disrupt um, what we're doing. And the, the, the thing is, at the point when you just think it's about the content, then you're probably missing a trick. Um, again, we've already mm. seen providers who are thinking about, if I estimate the forgetting curve, how do I make sure that I've given you just enough at the right time to keep you topped up? And it's little yeah. things like this, the innovation yeah. that's coming out of particular platforms, which I think is super interesting. Yeah, it's really interesting that 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 
it, that, that's particularly generative AI, I guess, but well, many forms of AI. It's, it's about prediction, pattern yeah. recognition and prediction. Yeah. And I think that predictive analytics is going to become a really interesting area, that kind of prediction and prescription of, from, from what yeah. we know now or what the machine bluntly knows about you know me this is what you should do next this is what i should do next or who yeah. i should speak to or what i should look at next is going to be really interesting yeah. uh, zara's yeah. put in a, a, a port a point that's got a lot of space that kind of building in human yeah. intervention I, I think that's yeah. really important i think i think it kind of reminds me of when i first started working at the bbc there's kind of these powerful editors you know who are the sort of the yeah. the human arbiters of what was a story worth yeah. telling i think that it, it kind of i wonder whether there's going to be a, bit of a renaissance in that kind of editorial judgments um you know to sort of supplement and manage uh, um what what, yeah. what algorithms uh, and systems create as well but i think it's really important i think it talks to one of the you know that that sense of human intervention in technology is going to become a capability a skill for, for learning and development professionals yeah. that we need to start to develop uh, i think an um, understanding yeah. data sources and how data is handled becomes a really really important foundational skill for us as well you know what what are these systems doing mm. and as you said that kind of mm. hands-on experience of these new co-pilot and assistant tools become really yeah, important yeah. i think as well yeah. on those co-pilot tools is i think they're going to become a, a learning and development tool set that's nothing to do with learning and development yeah. technology as well which i think is yeah. going to be an interesting feature of our landscape both commercially yeah, on the yeah. industry but also the the toolkits that we you know we use and apply and our audiences anticipate as well Mm -hmm. And it's fascinating, right? I just think if you, I think, and I know we've spoken about this in the past, Miles, where you start to segment almost the life cycle of uh, a learning function from engaging with stakeholders all the way through um, understanding measures of outcomes, thinking about just solution design, thinking about implementation, thinking about um, tracking value and governance and all those layers. You can probably find a role for, um, AI in every one of those to help inform yeah. the conversation. And that's one of the interesting things. It's not just about a recommendation, it's just to actually just harvesting some of the data and making it intelligible for you. So understanding what the issues are and where those go. So I think there's some really interesting things that are coming. Um, what, what some of the things that excite me, I know we sort of mentioned a little bit about the forgetting curve, even trying to analyze, and we've heard some interesting feedback from vet suppliers around this. If a buyer gives them a stack of documents that say this is our process and they may be given 20 documents which are all 30 pages long the ai can start to craft what it might recommend the structure is in a matter of minutes once it's had a chance to analyze the the, the documents in a way that if you'd given that to the instructional designer it may have taken much longer to get to that point in the design process um, it's not to say that's the final answer but it just feeds a faster decision-making process to say, does that sound right? Okay, now we go ahead, we're trying to populate that. And it's just these little small gains. It's almost, if you look at different things and say, how could AI start to take away some of the pain um, within a particular discipline? And I think the adaptive learning is a good example. Um, it's a real difficult thing to do yourself to create lots of different endpoints for us a working scenario or adaptive learning. The AI can start to populate those and give you a sense of structure yeah. in a way that it was difficult to do before. And I think what we're starting to see is the emergence within particular disciplines, some AI features that take away some of the pain. So I think we'll see almost little push, almost many little pushes in different deep areas rather than a big leap across everything. Yeah, so, I think yeah, you're right. Sort of I think, yeah. Widescreen view. Yeah. And it's like it's like the sort of sense. I know we've talked about this before. This is sort of sense that there's an emerging kind of e-learning, digital learning toolkit that's coming through, yeah. and it, you know it's not all yeah. going to come in one in one package. There'll be components that are about efficiency and analysis, components that are about feedback, and components that are about you know a, a, um, conversational interface. There'll be components that are about yeah. you know production and creation, and, and the combination yeah. of those creates the new toolkit. But they're not all wrapped in one system yet anyway uh, yeah. i think it's going to be really yeah, interesting yeah. to see how they take hold yeah yeah, yeah. Right, it's just right, those specialist I was saying we're about we're about at time. We could we could carry on and on, and this, the chat's really really busy as well. Um, I think we've maybe addressed most of the questions. We've got some people that are leaving now, so thank you for your engagement and uh, and your time. And uh, let's give a, a virtual round of applause to Miles and David for a whistle stop tour there and uh, great insights and information. And thank you again for all the chat and engagement. Thank you.